is a refresher. This was the site that we picked. I'll go back here. Um, so we had the three sites. I think we all picked the central site. It was the, the best of the three locations. So um, the footprint that you're seeing here, that's about 3,800. Hey. Yep. Um, I'm going to stop my share because we're not seeing what it is you're sharing. So oh, there, we're good. there we go. There we go. All right, so I'll start again here. So uh, as a refresher for the, the new member here, Joan, I believe. Yes, thank you. All right, so we're looking at putting a new playground on the west side of the city. If you need some orientation, this is Greenway Station. There's 14, the belt line is right here. So this is Market Street, which is right here. Um, and we looked at three locations and have selected the central location, which is adjacent to the parking ramp. And then this is the South Fork uh, here. And the USGS building is right there for your orientation. And of course the bike trail runs all the way through here and then up the hill to the golf course. Uh, so this location zoomed in here, I've dropped in a 3,800 square foot uh, footprint, which fits really well in the space. And you know, we can go up or down a little bit once we get into the budget discussion here. Um, so what I've done is worked with one of the local uh, playground reps, and I've got a bunch of different scaled options for playground equipment, and they're all different price tags. So what I, I want to do tonight is show you these graphics and hopefully at the end of the day we can say okay while we're not picking one of these selected or one of these uh, uh, examples we're at least agreeing that okay we want something in the price range of 35 grand or 70 grand or 100 grand just so that we can start to think through all right well now we know how much money we're going to allocate to this and how much space we need to plan for so I'm going to run through all these. They're in ascending uh, dollar amounts. So obviously, as we go slide to slide, they're going to get a little bit bigger. And the space that they consume is going to grow uh, with each slide. But the good news is even the most expensive option that I'm going to show you tonight will fit in this general footprint. So we have basically any, any option I'm going to show you tonight will work. All right, so this is what you get for about 35,000 and that number is the equipment cost. All right, so on top of the equipment, you're going to have about 25% of this number for installation and then you'll have your surfacing cost and we'll talk about those two options here in a minute, whether it's the poured in place rubber, which is the seamless uh, surface or we do the engineered wood fiber or other people call it mulch. So there's a big price delta between the port in place and the engineered wood fiber. So I'll show you those numbers here in a minute, but let's first get some consensus on the scale of the playground. So 35 grand, we get a structure, um, you know, maybe some climbing apparatus and probably not swings, although swings are not that expensive. So it could be added. All right, another example in the 35 to 40 range. Now here we start to add in two swing banks, similar scale structure, but we're adding in the swings. Okay, this jumps from 45 or up to 50,000. So it's a bigger structure. We get some standalone pieces in your swing banks. Okay, another example at 50,000. This is a, a, a nice size structure got a couple swing banks here, some standalone, maybe now we're integrating some benches. All right, another example at 50,000, right? S similar, you have your swings, a climbing structure, or sorry, play structure, and then some sort of climbing apparatus. All right, so another 50,000, again, structure, swings, some standalone pieces. Right, 55 to 60, you get a little bit bigger structure. Maybe they're bridged with some uh, some some floating uh, bridge pieces here. Another example of 55 to 60. All right, 
Another example in that same range. So now we're starting to jump up here. This is a $70,000 playground, much bigger structure. You got a three bay swing bank, some larger play equipment. This is a, a, an inclusive piece. Actually, both of these are inclusive pieces. And this is, uh, this is actually the footprint that I have dropped in on that. Uh, site plan. So this is the exact uh, equipment layout that I have on that site plan, just for reference. All right, so now we're up at about 100,000. So it's a much bigger structure. You start to see some ADA ramping coming into play. Can you scroll back once, Blake? Yes. Okay, just making sure, thanks. Yep. Yeah, so the big jump here is in all this uh, ADA ramping that adds a, a lot of dollars very quickly to a structure. That's why when we were talking about some of the benefits of, of building into a hill, you can actually get that, uh, that ADA access to the upper reaches of a, of a structure without all of the, uh, all the very expensive low level ramping. And then closing it off here, $100,000 of equipment gets you a really big structure, a bunch of different uh, standalone pieces. So a much bigger footprint as, as you can see as we go. So what I wanna do is, is talk about pros and cons here with you guys, get your feedback on what feels right to you in this, in this setting. And keep in mind, this is all very traditional, you know, post and deck metal uh, play structures that you would see in most community or neighborhood parks. There are other options. We can look at the nature play like we talked about at the last meeting. Um, but I just need to get a sense for scale and dollars that you want to allocate to this project. So the other thing to talk about, we looked at what are the other costs associated with a project like this. So not only do you have to buy the equipment, you have to pay for it to be installed, you have to put in your surfacing, but there are other things that go along with it, right? You have to pay for a contractor to come in, move all their equipment in, the insurance and the bonding and all that front end stuff. You've got some erosion control, so silt fence or silt sock because we're right on the river and we have that storm pond. Uh, we'll have a little bit of demolition, so stripping the topsoil, maybe clearing some of the existing brush that's in there little bit of earthwork to get the, flight, the site flat and prepared. And then most of our playgrounds, we, we do a concrete uh, ribbon curb around it to contain your surfacing. And if you do poured in place, which is the rubber, you have to do the concrete curb. Uh, if you do the wood fiber, you can get away with using uh, modular plastic or timber uh, framing. And then I accounted for a little bit of concrete for bench pads around the perimeter. Okay. Uh, we have stone underneath all of our concrete, of course, a small amount. We always under drain our playgrounds to make sure that after a rain event, our surface is playable right away. So I've added a small amount of, of storm sewer. And then I allocated uh, some, some money for a couple benches, maybe a trash can or cycling uh, receptacle. We'll probably want a new park sign since this is a new park coming online. And then we always at least or integrate at least one bike rack in our parks. And then we have some general restoration, seating, sodding, whatever we decide. And then I plopped in a couple of trees as a placeholder. So the big one you see here in pink um, is broken down down here. So right now I've plugged in 50,000 for a starting point on the equipment and then um, 25% of that number for installation gives you 12.5. And right now I'm holding the poured in place number since it's the more expensive at 18 bucks a square foot. So when you add these three together, we get the 13900. If you were to substitute the wood fiber for the poured in place, we have a reduction of 60, almost 63,000. So you can see it's a drastic change. I'm going to pause for a minute and let you guys digest all that. And while they do, I'll, I'll give some like feedback input to kind of put this in parallel to our other playground sites. Our, our standard replacement plan costs are 
a hundred thousand for a community park, sixty thousand for a neighborhood park, and forty thousand for a mini park. Um, I think the intent of this is to serve a neighborhood. I could definitely make the case for the, the $60,000 amount. Um, this is unique as it's not a replacement, it's a new. And so some of these costs are one-time costs that wouldn't necessarily be a standard of the replacement. There's also some things listed there on Blake's list that we typically are able to do in-house. Um, we, you know, the, the first four items are all things that, that we typically do. Um, the under drain are things that we have done on other sites. Um, the, the challenge with it is, is, you know, if we get too far into a project like this, it limits the crew's time to do other standard maintenance work too. So there's, there's give and take there. Um, but I, I think there are some things that, that can be done by our staff internally that wouldn't have to be contracted out. Yeah, that, that's a good point. I did frame this as if we were bidding or contracting everything out as one chunk. So and, the park sign, for example, you guys do usually direct purchase that. Um, that's an easy one to install. Tree plantings, that's another one that can be done in house pretty easily. So. We do all of our, we typically handle restoration. Um, you know, the. The, the big item here that if we were going to do it, it would be a, it'd be a deviation is the concrete work. We typically use the plastic form borders on all of our existing playgrounds. However, I see extreme value in, I know Blake shows a concrete curve. There are communities that do concrete sidewalks around their playground. It provides a very clean and also very ADA friendly amenity to the playground. Um, and Blake, I don't know how you had this position, how close to the path it would be, um, but obviously a consideration for trying to make some of the um, ADA components more accessible. Yeah, I think what we would do, Matt, I mean, this was just a placeholder for now, but we would- You might want me to it. put it online because you can't hardly see the numbers on the documents. Okay. Yeah, I'm just trying to get an idea what the- uh, yeah, sorry. So we would we would place this adjacent to the trail, or we would put a concrete sidewalk in between, so that you would have that accessible surface and ran ramping. But yeah, good comment. So back to the spreadsheet here, guys. This number right here, this fifty thousand. I'll change the color to something else. That's the one that we need to kind of plug and play with because my formulas will update, you know, as we change this number. So Matt, what did you say your standard equipment number is, 60? Well, so when we do a neighborhood park, that's 60, but that's in equipment and installation. Okay, so we're, we're so, pretty much right there with 50 and 12. All right, if we change this to 45,000, oops. We didn't update, did we? Oh, I had to do it, sorry. So now we're right at your 60 grand. Right, and I think the, the history on surfacing has been, um, when I first uh, came to Middleton, we did the Firefighters Memorial Park Playground. We did that in synthetic turf. And it was a roughly half of the cost of the equipment. So I think we spent 50,000 on equipment and 50 on synthetic turf. When we did the playground uh, renovation at the aquatic center, I think we spent about 30,000 in equipment and 20 to 25,000 in the port in place servicing. And the, the intent at that time was we tried both, we had both in our system. Our thought was, was to continue with the engineered wood fiber on our other sites and, and look into, and uh, it hasn't happened yet, but the idea of a universal or all abilities playground and having that be uh, the port in place or you know an increased surfacing, but that the likelihood of converting all of our playgrounds to port in place um, was going to be a financial, it was going to either do one of two things. It was gonna limit how quickly we could replace playgrounds or was going to significantly impact the size of playgrounds we were able to install. Um, 
because we didn't, I, there wasn't support for basically doubling the budget of every player. Yeah, so so I just real quick updated this formula, guys, to, to have the equipment at 45, the installation at about 25% of that, and then EWF for the wood fiber. So that gives us a total of 61.9, which is pretty pretty close to your 60 budget. And and I I won't tell Blake what we pay for engineered wood fiber, but you can cut that in half and then cut it in half again. Excellent. Again, this was a number to bid it out. So I, I know, I know. Great. Yeah. It, it's one of those fortunate items we have where we have a relationship, good relationship with a couple of playground install or providers that have given us their source for engineered wood fiber and we go directly to their source to purchase and uh, we take it a semi load at a time and get a very good deal on it. It's all about the relationship. That's the way to do it. So do you want me to go back to those images so you can get a handle on if we're, if we're looking at a $45,000 equipment budget? Uh, let's get back to those slides. Is this updating quick enough for you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we're gonna be looking at something like this or it's now I'm locked up. You know, something in this this neighborhood. I I would advocate that swings have to be a component. Mm -hmm. It's probably the most the thing we get feedback on. Yeah, really so, yeah, absolutely. And and Blake, is your recommendation at least a a double bay where you can do two belt seats and then you know accessible or child seats? Yeah, for sure. So I, I always recommend doing the, the double bay. And then I don't know if you remember one of the slides I showed had a, an extension arm coming off of one side. But sometimes we'll do that and we'll put an inclusive swing on that, which is you can either have a parent and a child in the same swing and then you can swing together or um, you can do a, a fully enclosed seat for someone with a, a disability and they, they need that enclosure for safety. So doing the double bay gives you that opportunity to extend at a very low cost. I mean, it's like 600 bucks to do the extension arm, which is, which is very inexpensive. So does this feel about right, guys, when you're imagining that space, what you would hope for? Yes, for me. I think, I think the, so. the, the challenge that I have, Blake, is is kind of navigating through traditional playground versus like a nature play component and 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 how that differs in what you know 45,000 of of swings and nature play looks like compared to you know this as a more traditional playground yeah um you'd be surprised at how little you get with the nature play uh it's amazing we're, we're doing a fairly good size one in West Dallas right now. And I was blown away when we saw the numbers. And it's cool because it's all black locust and locally harvested. And it's, you know, you, I was out there today and there were three carpenters actually cutting the logs and shaping them and fitting them together. So it's, it's really interesting and, and cool, uh, but it, it does get pretty expensive pretty quick. But you don't have anything in your system like it. So this would be an opportunity to do that. And it's a good setting for it. And do you want to talk about a little bit on the safety standards, the um, durability and the ADA impact of, of equipment like that? So all play equipment, whether it's manufactured out of metal or it's manufactured out of wood, has to meet the same ASTM and IPEMA standards for safety. Um, the, the interesting thing is all the custom wood stuff is, uh, or the nature play stuff is a little bit looser because they don't have to go through the rigorous testing that a structure like this would. 
but the designers who work for these um, nature play companies have all the same training as the factory folks who are doing these structures. And so they're really craftsmen uh, when they're when they're building this to follow those standards in the field. So they, they will meet all the same fall heights and uh, safety zone requirements. They just don't show up, at least in, in my world, every time I do a playground, I see all the safety zones and the fall heights in my models. I don't get that when we do nature play. It's more of a, uh, a field fit and trust thing, so. <coughs> Could we see some pictures or examples of the nature play equipment? Yeah, you know what, maybe I can download some off my phone that I took a few hours ago here while we wait. You guys talk amongst yourselves, let me do some magic quick. <laughs> I like the idea of nature play, but if it's so expensive. Oh, how long did? Something made up. I focus. How long is that? Blake, do they protect that in some way so that it? I mean, the life cycle. Obviously, if if cost is more, you'd hope that life cycle was at least comparable. We've been looking at you know twenty five years for replacement, and would want to ensure that you know we're we're getting close to that. Um. Yes, so the materials are all, the, the, the wood materials are all selected for longevity. So they use species like black locust, uh, Osage orange, which are really, really dense uh, woods and they last a long time. There is some maintenance to these things. This is one that we're working on up uh, in Vilas County. So a very, very different scale here, but um, Matt, to your question, yeah, there are going to be some boards you're going to have to replace, and logs will rot out. You know, anytime you have a flat surface of a natural material that's exposed to elements, it is going to rot. So this one was kind of cool. You know, they they took an old stump and they carved in a tic tac toe board, and then they have a, a bag full of, you know, log X's and O's, which is kind of fun. Um, one of the local craftsmen here built uh, two cars out of logs, which was pretty, pretty unique. I've never seen that before. But this is the, the natural version of a climbing structure. Right? You have an elevated platform, some tunnels, and then you are going to have a traditional modular plastic slide integrated in. Uh, in this setting, they brought in, yeah, here's a, a good shot of that car. It's kind of fun. So it's imaginative play. Which is which is really great for kids with a little version. This was kind of fun. They they brought in a little music garden. So here are this is all uh, red pine framing, and then they they took a bunch of bamboo pieces and made this wind chime garden, which is really unique. There's just another shot of that that play structure. So it's a different experience. So these are more traditional congas and um, a xylophone that's actually metal. There's a great shot of a bamboo wind chime. So this was kind of fun. This is my favorite piece up there. This is a, a spider web. So this was a you know, big nautical rope and they used the netting. One of the kids' favorite spots here. That's all I have from that site. Oh, well, Blake's looking for other pictures. Um, we've ran into, we've, we've brought this subject of nature play as well as musical instruments up in every one of our playground replacements. And nobody wants musical instruments close to their house. And, and the nature play is, is so new that most I guess the majority of people want a traditional playground in their neighborhood. What's interesting here is there's no homes directly near and we don't have an existing playground. So if we were going to do something different or innovative or um, 
non-traditional, I, this is a great spot to explore those opportunities. Yeah, I totally agree with that. The fact that you're not fighting uh, some preconceived notions in the neighbors is, is a real great opportunity. All right, I found my pictures from today. I'm gonna copy them over. Well, actually here, I'll just pause it today. <clears throat> so the, the closest one of these in the area is at Camrock, which is a Dane County park. Um, my kids have been there and absolutely love it. So Camrock? Camrock. It's uh, between Cambridge and Rockdale. Therefore, right. the so you can see this is in construction. This is all black locust logs. Um, Let's see if I can toggle through. Yeah, so we've got our, our pedestrian space here. This is all gonna be poured in place rubber mounded up. So we actually filled most of the site with gravel. So it, the thing is perched up, which gives us uh, some natural elevation change. Oh, it's reading off my phone here, guys, I'm sorry. It's not like this. And then we built these uh, retaining walls out of the logs, again, to give a place space underneath the, the structure. Um, the kids can climb up the logs, they can come over here to the steps. This will all have netting on it, so they won't be able to fall off, of course. Yeah, so you can see it's mid-construction, but this is this is what they do. They bring in a whole pile of logs and they just craft it on site. And here's your scrap pile. So I'm sorry, I don't have any finished shots, but yeah, not very interesting shots here. It is interesting. It shows us how they're how they're made, how they're built. Let's see, we got one more. So we ended up using this, there's gonna be some uh, benches in here. Um, we ended up putting some pretty pretty good sized stonework in for the steps getting up the, the slope here. So you can be creative with the natural materials. This is in West Dallas in case anyone frequents the Burnham Bowl. Opens at 5 p.m. So I can hunt for more, but it may take me a little bit to find the other some, some other examples today. I think we get a sense of it, Blake. Okay. Yeah, you can see. So it's got some pretty good elevation to it. Can you go back to the, the question, the cost question? You said <clears throat> that it was significantly more expensive and you know this kind of structure we're looking at now. Yeah, so that structure that I was just showing you and the port in place was about 140,000. And the, the footprint of, of that is considerably smaller than this. We don't have any swings. We don't have any of the standalone pieces, but you're paying for that craftsmanship and that custom build. I mean, there is not gonna be another one like this anywhere in the world because this, this company, GRG, they're based out of Milwaukee. Uh, this is what they do. They, they custom design and custom build, uh, you know, collaborative playscapes. So. Would it, I'm just thinking out loud here, Blake, but would it be worth designing both a, um, traditional playground like depicted here on the screen and also to you know depicting a designing a, a nature play of what that's going to look like for i don't know if we want to go the same budget if you want to allow more to to see what the nature play could look like i i don't know what your thoughts are but i i'm kind of sensing there's interest in the nature play but probably not interest if it's double the cost yeah i i think because I, I think the, the the term of 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 when it comes to playgrounds is play value there's uh, you know so many elements that provide play value and you want i think a, a rational thought would be is if this element has 11 
play value, you know, there's 11 play components to it and how they count those is always interesting, but you'd want something comparable on the nature play, right? Yeah, right. And my question, Blake, is there are some nature play that do more of the prefab, not the craftsman on-site construction, which I understand really could be costly, but are there other other options or vendors that do that style of playground? Out of natural wood. Um, <clears throat> I'd have to think about that a little bit. All the ones we've ever engaged in have been custom. So Matt, are you thinking, because I know a lot of homes, they do this quite a bit. They, um, at, the, at the site that they're, they pre-construct the log home. They put it all together, then they label everything, you know, where the factory is, disassemble it, bring it in on a truck, and then just basically reassemble, as opposed to trying to cobble it together on site. I'm just, my thought was the playground industry is pretty smart, and this nature play has become very popular, Yeah, has one of the big playground manufacturers developed a line of, of natural, it's yeah. something that looks more natural that's still very similar to how they construct regular playgrounds. Yeah. I guess I'm just looking at this and thinking that, you know, if you're in the pine forest, that that would be really cool to have. Right. When you're up against the side of a parking garage, <laughs> I don't think we're gonna fool anybody. And um, the play value, Obviously, you get more bang for your buck with the more traditional stuff. I like the idea of trying some some things that are kind of innovative that would not maybe be well received in the middle of the neighborhood, like the the musical instruments. I, I think it'd be great time to try to out some of those things. But I just think that um, with the budget and everything else, this stuff is. I mean, even just the traditional things are <laughs> cheap. <laughs> And never have been. Um, I just think it's kind of important to, in this safe case to try to stretch the budget as much as you can, in my opinion. Do, do we have a sense as to how much uh, we're looking at for the whole project? I mean, if I go back to the cost worksheet, you know, we've got our 60 grand in here, you come down here and yes, some of this can be extracted to do in house. Um, you know, is that 111 a scary number or are we comfortable with that? Do we push it to 140, 150? I mean, what's the threshold of pain, I guess. And then maybe I can come back to you and with some better options. Yeah. Well, let's, let's yeah, the funding maybe. source? Yeah, Art development. Yeah. Okay. Art de and you know, we only have so much. Yeah. Just parks are expensive. Right. That's yeah. just the, way, the nature of the beast. Yeah. That, that's that's <laughs> what we're trying to establish yeah. in this yeah. meeting. So that's what I thought. Yeah. I I I agree with what you're saying. It doesn't seem quite like the right place to have a nature play. Right. It seems a little forest or just not part of the 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 area we have a isn't there going to be a big um, community park for two along over by um, you know where the corn leaves was you haven't heard any rumblings about that what 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 was the witch well up on junction uh, no. Sorry, I thought there was something Talking west of Great Rapun, that area, because we're no. talking about that later on the meeting. Okay, <laughs> all right. Or are you all talking right. about the one on Parmenter up by the possibility of one on the creek? So we discussed something there once upon a time. Yeah, but you know, Matt, the other spot to maybe explore a nature play is up at wood the Woodland Park site in Bishop's Bay. If that ever comes to fruition, you know, that's a much nicer natural setting. I, I mean, I guess this is 
uh, and maybe I'm putting this the way. This space is a little bit of an afterthought, and that you know it wasn't pre-planned for a park space. Mm -hmm. We're putting one in, and and um, we're trying to provide some nice park facilities for people who have decided that they really like something, but I wish I had a better handle on how many users we would have. Um, and one of the things that came up at the Conservancy Lands was how many people have kids, how many, what does the school see in terms of this stuff? And there's a little bit of a question of what the need is. And I don't so, think anybody's quantified that. It's extremely hard to quantify because the, you can't drill the census data down to that level. I know. Um, um, you can do it in, in tracks, but the track is most Middleton. So right, right. Um, it, the, the, the thing that's been beat over my head is that there are grandparents that live there whose children come and visit and want access to playgrounds. Too. And, and oh, so I live there. Oh, you do? Oh, I live yeah. on Deming Way. Great. We've got a resource. There are so many kids out playing well, in the yard the, at the apartment. The other thing I was going to say is we probably won't know for, I mean, I don't know if yeah. it's a stable community, if I can use that term yeah. at this point. It takes a few years before things are sift out. And then, I mean, there's, there's um, you know, most of the apartments over there, a lot of kids over there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, Oil run, I don't know if that's still in the Middleton. Area. I assume that these are relatively young children. There's a lot of young kids, kids out mm -hmm. playing soccer. And, and I mean, the, in the yard outside of my building, there's kids out there every day. So what do you think there, have, if I can push you on the spot for this, what do you think their, their and their parents' objective for playground equipment would be? I think, you know, they, they would be happy. I mean, they love both, you know, right, either right. one is, is exciting. Um, that I would have to think about. I mean, I, you know, I'd maybe ask a few people or something. But uh, you, you think they'd be visiting the site to so, be used? Yeah, to I, yeah I want to drive over there to that specific site to right. see, you know, and then you've got the uh, right on Market uh, Street. You've got the new apartments there that's behind Johnny's. I can't think of the name of it right oh, now. Oh, I, um, I don't. I don't know yeah, where you're talking about. But that's you know, it's the Market Street apartments. Okay. Okay. Yeah, those are right here. <clears throat> I mean, you see people walking with their kids and strollers, and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, bikes, a lot, lot of parents, you know, with their kids out there training them to learn how to ride bikes and so right, forth. And, right. uh, kids play soccer in the, the yard. So, sounds like well, maybe a little older section of kids than I was thinking. Yeah, we, there, there's, I mean, and it goes from very young, from babies sure. and strollers to you know, uh, kids in middle school. Okay. So. To answer what's available in the park development fund, I, they're probably about 575,000 that could be allocated towards this project. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not I suggesting that we build no, no. a <laughs> level of playground. I'm just saying no, that no, oh, it's fun to Yeah, build. I mean, so and about, as far as the equipment, you know, there's a range of kids. Uh, I think both of them looked good. Mm -hmm. I loved the nature one myself because, I mean, I have my own grandchildren that I take to parks all the time. Well, it looks great. And they, they, they would love the creativity of, you know, it inspires a lot of, right. you know, uh, self-creativity. So I thought that was pretty cool myself. So what, a, go ahead, what, what about the idea of uh, he had some traditional integrated with the um, with the nature park slides and maybe we could still put a, a swing some a yeah. swing set or yeah. something. I think swings swings those, are always the those two all items are pretty popular. How tall are the swings these days? They're not tall enough. Safety concerns, but yeah. how tall are they? Do you know? The uh, like up top of my head. Mm -hmm. Eight feet posts, eight foot posts for swings. Um, most of them are probably at a nine foot height. Okay, well that's better than I thought. So, so I was over and walked around there and sat there for a while on Tuesday and just kind of tried to get a feel of 
the area and trying to picture um, what I thought would be good there. And I think that a nature, a nature park would be would be nice. There's that little forested area. Um, I'll go over there tomorrow and look. I haven't been over there. I yeah, mean, I'm familiar with I walk there in that area all the time. Forested area right on like to the southwest of yeah, right in there. So maybe um, maybe we could have like a natural tree for it. I you know, four big posts out of some logs and, and uh, have a slide that's prefabricated, you know, more traditional stuff off of it, possibly. Is that a, is that, there's a, is there a hybrid model on these things? Yeah, I see no reason why you couldn't combine a few things. Right, I, right. I don't know enough <laughs> about it. To, that's a good question for Blake. Blake. Can you hybrid one of these? Uh, yeah, you can. We've actually done some that use metal posts and deck, but then we bring in uh, instead of a, let me see, you know, instead of metal railings, uh, you can do, I don't know if any of these examples would have it, but actually you can do fake wood paneling that actually looks pretty good. You can do traps, you can do recycled lumber. Um, so it's not natural log, but it is actually using, um, you know, some recycled materials, which which is good. But I don't have any good examples here. Uh, the one in West Allis we're doing you know, was all stick built, but then we had the the plastic slide coming off of it, and you can't really slide on wood. So you're going to have to have either stainless or plastic slides. You could absolutely do a swing bank, you know, uh, on the in the in the playscape as well. And so Blake, maybe, maybe there's a web climbing structure or something to supplement the wood structure. Put you on the spot a little bit, Blake, but based on the conversation and the interest in the nature play and maybe even some nat some traditional components, how do you suggest that we proceed in, in trying to get some examples and costs of what this would look like? Um, I would say if you can give me a few weeks, so maybe I'll sit down with GRG and see what they would suggest for a size of, of or a footprint of this size. I, I think a budget of 60 grand of the equipment is probably not going to get you what you will be happy with. So if we are going to explore that, I would encourage you to take a little leeway with the budget on the nature play. You know, I think. I, I am content, oh, come on slides, with, with the, the 35, or sorry, the 45, now this example, I think would be very suitable and fitting if we were to go more traditional, but I would encourage you to add, you know, half again, if we're gonna explore the nature play. And if you want, I can come back in a month and show you an example of both, and then you guys can, or yeah, make, make a decision. Yeah, keep it 75 or less for the nature play. We need a big motion for this to have Blake come back in about a month with some options. So I'll make a motion for this. Yeah, I'll make a motion that he comes back with both traditional and, and uh, hybrid with nature play and try to keep the cost, the cost at 75 max for the nature play and uh, less for the traditional. So the motion is <clears throat> to have Blake return back to us with um, uh, a hybridized uh, model. Two models. Two models. One hybrid and one the more traditional. Oh, okay. Go ahead. I can second that. Okay. okay. And we have a second. Do we have any discussion on the motion? The one thing that I'd suggest that we focus right now on is the budget for the play equipment and the install. Mm -hmm. And let me figure out what our additional costs are with talking with park staff and what we can do versus what we need others to do and and try and keep that discussion focused on on the tangible and we'll right. figure out the others as we move forward. All right. Okay. Yep. All right. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor saying aye. 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 On the opposed, motion carries. All right. Thank you very much, Blake. Thanks, guys. See you in a month.
All right, next agenda item, citizen request for terrace tree removal policy drafts. And Mark is here. So you got it. Give me patient. Um, so, for those of you who don't know me, because I know there's a couple of new faces, I'm Mark Wagner, I'm the Assistant Director for the Department of Oversee and Forestry and Conservancy Lands portions of the city. I've been uh, with the city for full-time 11 years, and I was an LTE for a number of years prior to that. So, uh, with a Parks LTE, Conservancy Lands LTE, so I've been in that uh, for quite some time. Um, what you're looking at here before you is the result of previous conversations we've had here in regards to requests from citizens uh, to remove street trees. And what really necessitated it was, um, for the most part, residents really not agreeing with my opinion and having it then come before PRFC and not really having anything uh, policy-wise in writing for, for that. So I uh, took a crack at it knowing full well that most of the times drafts, you need to have something up on the wall for people to shoot down and tear apart. Um, my goal for this honestly was to just really try to get um, facts on both sides of the issue to be able to be presented to a uh, committee to be able to decide and go from there. And that's uh, really the gist of it in a nutshell. So um, I'll leave it at that. And um, I'll just open it up for questions on anything and everything in there. Well, I just add a, a couple of things. And that what Mark has put together here really kind of synopsizes how the city's dealt with these, these requests in the past. And going back some time. And, and the other, the thing that it strengthens is we've had, you know, residents come forward and, and voice concerns over financial impacts that they've experienced with um, either damage to their property, damage to their homes from a street tree. And it, it quantifies that as they request for removal that they provide proof of, of those expenses, either with receipts or estimates for work that needs to be done so that it puts some you know, validity and strength to, to their request. Because I, I think last time there were a lot of, and I'm not accusing that anybody was saying anything, but I think if this was to move forward as a policy and we get more of these requests, I mean, people may come and, and say some things that we wanna make sure are true. But, I guess one question I have on that is that if you have a tree that is encroaching upon your stuff and you spend money or spend time doing it yourself of uh, doing some pruning and this is going to be habitual um, and then you go to the city and you say, what about this? And they say, well, well let's see your receipts. Well, I didn't know I needed to save my receipts. That was sort of back 10 years ago. How, how do we deal with those? The only thing that I honestly could see fitting that bill would be a rotor rotor bill because if they're pruning their own street tree, they're not supposed to be doing it to begin with. Well, oh wait, okay, maybe I need clarification. So a homeowner cannot prune a street tree. They're not supposed that, to without our knowledge or permission. That, that extends into their property? Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. How do we how do we notify residents of that? Um, as with most of our city ordinances, it's pretty much um, you get some people that call and ask first. And you have other people that just do it, and unless we know that they're doing that, or a resident next door neighbor or something that lets us know, then yeah, you're right. We don't know. Well, the general rule of thumb that I know of is that the tree. Um, or by the vegetation that extends into your yard, you are able to prune it. Is that not the general? That, that is works? my understanding of the law. Too. So why is it 
different with the city with the city trees than it is with your neighbor's tree? Um, I think the difference here is that, in my mind at least, since it's a city asset and we have people, myself, in budgets that are intended to do that pruning, that we want it done correctly. Most of the time in my experience when a resident is doing a property line cut on their own, it's because communication is broken down between both sides and nothing is happening. Uh, and I think it you're right. Becomes, uh, like, all right, this is the last straw, so now I'm going to shear it up the side of the, of the property line, which really isn't ideal anyway. No. It's, uh, you know, bad prune cuts in the wrong location and whatnot. Uh, I mean, I agree. Even if you live with your neighbor, you ought to be trying to come up with something that works mm -hmm. well for the tree and for both yeah. sides. And you're basically saying to do the same thing. But I know that in the past, I don't know if this is true or recently, but in the past, sometimes the city has not done a great job of getting some trees pruned up on a timely basis. Mark, do you want to explain kind of the history on street tree pruning and why that's the case? Yeah. So when I first started here um, as a city forester, as I said, 11 years ago, um, really there wasn't a dedicated budget for street tree pruning. And it fell onto the Public Works Department to prune trees. And they did that in winter months when they weren't out plowing snow. Um, as you know, that's kind of uh, at the whims then of nature. So that if we're getting a lot of snow, well, then they're not getting any pruning done whatsoever. And when they were going out and pruning, we didn't have a bucket truck at the time either. So they had a platform in the back of a pickup truck and a pole saw. And that was how they would prune trees. So when I looked back at the number of trees that they were pruning, it really came down to street trees are getting pruned about once every 16 years. Yeah. And so what would happen then is a drastic over pruning when they would go through because they would know that I can buy there again. And that's not good for the tree. Residents hated it because it was going from a big bushy tree to a little lollipop. And so um, less than a year was saved. So I think it was like my second year here where mm -hmm. I finally said, no, we need a bucket truck. So we got the bucket truck. And so then we started on uh, doing the first round of pruning, which really focused more on just the street side, clearance pruning, getting canopy up so that we're not hitting vehicles, um, our own city vehicles, as well as dump trucks, semis, what have you. And Ideally, what you want to have is you want to have street trees on a basically like a five to seven year rotation. So I then put that in the maps and kind of divvied up the city into six zones because I'm like, all right, let's split the difference. We'll go for a six year rotation. And then kind of try to, based on that number of trees per quadrant, um, took what we had been paying for pruning and then, you know, multiply that out. And went from there and approached the city and and they said all right let's let's start setting some of these sites that we can get some contractors in here to do that because we still even with the bucket truck weren't going to be able to get caught up on that um so we started to do that and it was it was uh working rather well and then our lash board came along and we kind of got a little bit lucky there in the fact of um the blessing and the curse, you know, we removed a whole bunch of ash trees, but at the same time, we got rid of a whole lot of maintenance problems with those ash trees. But then that really sucked up a lot of uh, time and money there. Um, the other unfortunate side effect with Emerald Ash Borer was that uh, companies had a plethora of work available to them. And as a result, Nobody really wanted to start bidding again on uh, municipal work because there's a heck of a lot more money on tree removals on the private side than it is trying to do low bid for city street tree work. Um, it worked better when work was a little bit more scarce and they were kind of hungry for work because then we would get better pricing. But it's even still that way now where there's more work to go around than there are companies to fill it. 
especially now, even with post COVID, a lot of places are having a hard time getting employees no different than the food industry anybody like that. Um, the short of it being that same amount of money that we started with um, hasn't really been increased for probably four or five years. And so that money isn't going as far as it used to be either. So um, are we still on that six year rotation? No, it's probably more like seven or eight now at that point because we've lost some ground. The plus side though really is the fact that now we're, we are done with EAB and we for, And so we've got a little bit more time now um, internally to, to deal with some more of these issues ourselves, um, meaning storm damage response, road hangers, things like that, that we can get to. And some of these um, immediate needs for uh, requests on pruning that like we get a call and it's like it's on our house well we can get out there and do that we still do though try to do bulk pruning blocks every year and we set it up and we see how far it can go and then that's kind of the gist as to where we're at with our, with our pruning program we are dealing with a backlog of, of issues because of not only the 16 year rotation, but because a lot of the trees when they were put in didn't get the structural pruning when they were young. So then a lot of the defects, if you will, that would be addressed much easier when they were little were left to become bigger issues. Uh, bigger than like <laughs> yes exactly double leader crossing branches uh, things like that that yeah you need to catch it young you know you're, you're good and so we are definitely making more of a point now too with everything that we did plant uh, post emerald ash four that you know we are factoring that in now too to get that structural pruning put in because yeah if you get the, the tree trained right at a young age you know, it's going to make for a much easier thing to maintain in the future. I, I think you're absolutely right. A lot of the problems that we're running into are from past practices and not maintaining things. It sounds like we're kind of falling back down that slippery slope to where we were. And when we don't maintain things that we're responsible for, they get to be a problem. Oh, yeah. And in addition to not having spent money to to take care of these things, we I think the city made some decisions as to placement of trees, and this is now coming to, to bite us. Um, I, I did have a nice long discussion with Lisa uh, tonight, and um, he and I are not on the same page. Um, I mean, he's a great guy, but um, I just have a little different opinion about about some of these things. Um, I, I can imagine. And and um, it's as I said to him, you know, if if my dog goes to my neighbor's yard and digs it up, it's my dog. I'm responsible for it, and I feel that you know I, I shouldn't have to pay for the remediation of that lawn. Do whatever it takes. And we're running into situations where the city's tree has caused damage. And I don't understand why homeowners would have to bear all the costs that go along with this. And um, some of the stuff um, Dave was suggesting is like opposite from what I was thinking. Um, I understand he's saying, hey, this is infrastructure. This is an asset. I say, yeah, it's an asset, but it's much like a swimming pool is an asset. It's, it's great for certain things. But it also has problems. And not everybody looks at these things the same way. And, and we haven't had a lot of input from the homeowners on, on various things. And in my limited exposure to trying to get things pruned, the city's been poor at, at responding. And, and that gets to be a problem. And I'm not, I'm, I thank you for everything you've done. I mean, yeah. really, thank you for this too, because you're absolutely right. It's a hell of a lot easier to criticize the tree, and you've done the like, work to create it. A um, few things, I guess. Um, in terms of placement of trees, yes, completely agree. 
that we have lots of issues all over town. Unfortunately, um, we've we've fixed that now moving forward with the developments. Right. Um, what what used to happen was it was on the developers to plant the trees when a new development was going in, and they would do it as soon as the roads were put in, prior to any house. So they would put them in every 35, 40 feet. And then a lot would be sold. And then they would put, all right, this is where the house is. So that means the driver's gonna be here. Oh, there's a tree there, you know? Mm-hmm. Or, well, let's squeeze that driveway in right there and then we'll leave the tree. And then we have instances in North Lake and all over the rest of the town where then we have a tree where it's two feet away from the driveway. I've got that in my house in the city of Madison. It's literally 16 inches away from my driveway. And uh, now what we do is like over in Bishop's Bay, they submit the plan, they submit the landscape plan. I, I approve both of them. They then give me the money for those trees. We put them in an in account. And then after the houses are built, then we come in and put the trees. So then we can then get the right placement and oftentimes, too, it sometimes means that we don't even get all of the trees in that were in that original plan because of where the driveways are, you know, we factor in utilities, underground mm-hmm. utilities, and private property trees. Don't have. And so you we, can distribute the species. Yes. You know, instead of having the mono. Yeah, but, exactly. But our new, pl- our new problem is <laughs> homes go in, they put the irrigation, irrigation lines in the terrace where they're not allowed to become right. trees, and now we have irrigation. We had six of them this spring. Really? Day. Yeah, <laughs> five of them in one day. And and how does that work for you? Um, they're not supposed to be there. Oh, I know. So obviously they're upset residents. Yeah. But at the same time, when we call up Digger's Hotline. No, you're not going to see it. No, exactly. They have no record of it or anything like right. that. At the same time, I personally don't really have a lot of sympathy for a homeowner because we put that laugh out in that terrace area denoting where that tree is going yeah, for, with the name of that tree. Pretty good period of time. And it's out there at least yeah. three weeks. <laughs> so, so you say you don't have a, a lot of sympathy. You have some sympathy for them because I when my from my experience, it, it wasn't from um, trees. It was from... Uh, pushing back snow plow uh, with snow plow and and having it whack the heads and then they are demanding that the town pay for the replacement and 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 I had no sympathy at all. Yeah. Well, we've tried to educate the companies in the area that are installing the yeah. irrigation systems not to do that, but I think they run into issues with the homeowners. Homeowners. No, they they know already. It's just, mm-hmm. to me, it's just like, you know, come on, use your head. Instead of putting the irrigation system, like if this is the street and this is the sidewalk and here's our tree area and you're putting the irrigation system here and here, why don't you just put it on the private property side of the sidewalk and shoot it over the sidewalk? It does the same darn thing. Yeah. I don't you know. And it gets rid of that problem. <laughs> um, the issue, unfortunately, ends up being then that they're instantly mad at us. And Tony Crown, the city forester, now had residents slam, you know, basically sliding doors in his face. Also, like that. Just, Olson Tune does a lot of installation. They're calling up and saying, "Well, you're not calling us." It's like, again, how are we supposed to know? <laughs> Olson Tune isn't very big to deal. No, <laughs> no. So, um, you know, that's just a, another side effect of that. So, um, to get back to you know, the, the backlog of issues, really the, the approach that we've been taking is that if we run into circumstances where the tree becomes a safety issue, or if it's a problem because of construction, street reconstruction, then, you know, we, we will rectify the situation at that point in time. And like over in uh, Orchid Lane and, uh, Marigold, not not Marigold, but over in that neighborhood, we have had probably three or four of them this this year with the street reconstruction because of having to replace water boxes. That's that's a that's a major one really for most of the trees because of that. So if a tree is in decent health, but it's it's heaving a curb, it's heaving a sidewalk, 
and it's got a water box issue. To me, that's strike one, that's strike two, that's strike three. But if it's just one, especially if it's a curb, because in that case, the city does pay 100% of the curb replacement. In that case. And so then that, that to me really then is like, all right, well, let's slip form it. On the other side, for private property sidewalks, I have had some luck in working with the engineering uh, public works downstairs to in some cases where we have curved the sidewalk further away, right? We've done that. Mm -hmm. We have done a little bit of humping a little bit. And prior to three years ago, they wouldn't even grind. Right. You know, I was just straight well, we've, we've made a lot of progress. Yes. As well as the cost share. Right. Now, I would say if there's one thing that I'd be more than happy with to have you guys want to promote would be expansion of that cost share. Why should it just be limited to sidewalks to me? It's like if it's if it's heating an apron or something like that, too, we should be cost sharing for that, too. I'm, I'm in complete agreement with you. Well, now. I I sorry, I'm, I'm a little more radical. But, um, you know, so I got neighbors behind me and they've got kids and they enjoy my sidewalk and be able to ride a bike on it and everything. And I get to shovel that sidewalk in the winter and I'm fine with that. But they're on a cul-de-sac, so they got zip for sidewalk. And I think they get every bit as much utilization of my sidewalk as I do. So I don't understand why it is that I get to pay for that sidewalk. And they don't have to, or my neighbor next door who lives on the corner, and yeah, he gets a discount for those that second half there, but he's got a lot of squares of sidewalk. And then I got another neighbor, sorry, I'm on a rant, <laughs> but I got another neighbor who was unfortunate enough to have a bicyclist ride through the semi-wet concrete, only to have the concrete the public works people tell them that. They were responsible for notifying the city that the contractor didn't properly keep people out of it. And now they get to pay for the, at the next round for the, those same squares to get replaced again. And it was several squares. And where's the city's responsibility for taking a look at the work they contract for? And again, I'm on a rant. I apologize. I love these rants. Part of Part of my disdain for the policies on sidewalks is hitting you in the face about this stuff. And mm -hmm. it's in me, it, to my mind, it's, it's insult to injury. I mean, we're, people are having to pay for the sidewalk, paying for the apron, paying for house repairs. And now you end up with, with the uh, paying for the removal of the tree. And Leaf would like for them to pay for the replacement of the tree. And I, I understand those perspectives. I, I, I do. Um, but, and, and if the city were better at paying for some of the other costs, I might feel differently about it. But the, the one thing that I would really like to see on here is that the um, part that we get to look at this and made a recommendation to finance and council as to who should pay. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that in every case, the city should pay for it, but I think that on occasion, maybe that maybe the yeah. city should. I can see that. I, 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 I don't really have something one way or the other on it, but I, I guess I could see it being something, you know, how do you draw the line on which it applies? Yeah, and you know the, the fact is is that once it gets to finance and council, it doesn't really matter. But you know, I would just feel better, like I. <laughs> yeah, and I know, and I I know I mentioned this before, like in the last case where we brought it up, is that you know, what I really don't want is to have it be where, um, as a professional, I'm saying you know the tree, in my professional opinion and experience, is healthy. It's not posing any safety issues. And then it's deemed that it's coming down and we have to pay for it. Um, if, if perfect world, I had an additional pot of money sitting off to the side that could be used for that, mm -hmm. that'd be a different story too. Because nice. otherwise it's like, you know, for the first seven, eight months of the year, I'd have to leave it sit there, you know, to try to potentially cover something that I'm not sure is going to happen or not. And then, and then at the end of the year, try to scramble to, to use it on something else. Um, if there was some way 
to, you know, figure that out a little bit better. And that might be a different story too. I, I have not been able to figure that one out yet. Well, the other, I mean, and I know this is kind of written in the draft here, but if you start to, you know, I'd be concerned if you take a lot of the burden off of all the burden off homeowners. Yes, there's going to be a potential policy, but at what point are they going to start saying, well, I just don't want that tree there. And all of a sudden these requests come in, like I want this tree cut down and I'm going to come up with some bogus reason that it needs to come down and I'm going to go through this. And, you know, I know that they are, should be including damage receipts and stuff like that, but, you know, if, all it takes is just a couple, like one or two instances and that word that, well, the city will cut down a tree if you do X, Y, and Z. And, uh, you know, they, if they don't have to pay for it. I'm not saying they, yeah. Then I, so I see what you mean by, by maybe some cases the city would help, help or pay for the, for the tree. Some other cases that you have the individual homeowners. But if it's like, how do you, where is the delineation there? Right. Well, and that's that's the hard part, pretty sure. Right? Well, I, 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 just, there's something I mean, that I mean, if they say that this tree is creating a problem, that you know they could come up with some sort of documentation mm -hmm. that you know proves that that tree I, is. I, I, yeah. That's, that's exactly what we're asking yeah, for. Right. Is yeah. is, yeah, is with the receipts, and I mean, and and that's really the point. It's not necessarily monetary costs, but but some documentation that this is an ongoing issue. And and I would I would hope that it would be as as much as anything going back and saying well, you know we contacted you here and we contacted you here and we contacted you here, and despite your efforts we still have this problem. Mm -hmm. And I guess that one of the things that I'd like to see is and I'm may not believe this I'm trying to advocate for you because um, I'm thinking that if if you had a better budget for doing the maintenance of the trees, we wouldn't have these issues. And there's no impetus to give more money unless there's some something to pushing you that way. And, and having the city have to pay for the removal in some cases and, and repair costs would be something to push them towards budgeting more money. But doesn't your... Um... <clears throat> You, you have that risk assessment um, program. No. And I thought that was good. You, you're certified in that. As well. No? Uh, Tony and myself. It's Tony and yeah. yourself? <clears throat> and that talks about the crown and which branches are hazardous. And, and that, yeah, it addresses that safety component. Right. So, so aren't we pretty much talking about the roots? Causing That's the what I'm wondering, yeah. Well, on occasion. The branches are going to, I mean, it depends on how close the house is to the, to the sidewalk in the street. Right. And there are going to be cases where they're playing close. Yeah. And to be completely honest with you, that's kind of a ticking time bomb with the entirety of Milton Hills, with the way that that developed. Yeah, so because those are very close. Very close, very upfront, very, you know, uh, small setbacks from the <clears> sidewalk. <throat> and there are lots of trees that we have issues with over the top of the house. So there are definitely uh, inherited issues without a doubt. And I guess really part of this too is just, it's trying to get some of that ambiguity out. And I know, unfortunately, oftentimes it does come down to dollars and cents. So that's kind of like, all right, well, let's just whittle it down to really what makes the biggest difference to people. And that's the dollars behind it. And also trying to recognize and acknowledge the the value of a tree other than just having it be there you know and providing shade you know there are values that that tree provides and so it's it's trying to you know just have a level playing field between two sides and if it still ends up then at that point where it's like deemed that it's going to be cut down well it's like all right i would feel professionally not still happy but at the same time i will have presented the case for the tree and then you know I've, I've done my part. So on um, on this assessment of the tree, do you look at the roots? We do. Um, unfortunately, though, with the way that's designed, again, since it's a safety hazard analysis, mm -hmm. oftentimes with a heating sidewalk or an apron, 
you know, that's not really a safety concern. That's not going to be damaging um, potential life property type of thing. It's got it's got the heaving. Yeah, sure, we we know that. But I guess we'd have to amend that to probably try to include that. But unfortunately, the downside with that really honestly is there's a strong correlation, sure, that, okay, this is heave, there's a tree right here, and there's a strong correlation that it might be doing it. But it's not always the case. You know, you go out in front of City Hall over here um, by the driveway, there's seven or eight slabs of concrete that are marked for replacement there. There's not a tree around there. So obviously there's still other things. And the only sure way to know is to pop that concrete up and then take a look to see if it's the root causing it or not. And at that point, um, I'm still not opposed to cutting a root if we're far enough away and it's a small enough root. We've done it. We, we do it. It's just that we, we don't know that until it's up and out. Oh, okay. Well, that seems to be, that was her issue. The resident that came to us, that was her issue. Mm -hmm. us. Yeah. So and I, uh, eight years ago or so, you published a list of pieces of sidewalk that needed to, you beat the city. Sorry, not you personally, of course. Now you're not public works. Uh, the sidewalk that needed to get replaced in my general neighborhood. And so I looked at each of them, and uh, I, almost 90% were adjacent to a tree. So I'd say there's a strong correlation. Mm -hmm. And but I guess my point is that it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a death sentence for that tree. No, 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 right. no. But it, the city ought to do something more than tell me that I have to pony up money for the sidewalk. Yeah, unfortunately, that's not something I need. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Again, I'm ranting on things that don't have anything to do with you. And, and you know, if anything, this is kind of good timing in the regards of, you know, the budget process is starting <clears throat> relatively soon. Yeah. Um, but knowing full well that trying to get extra money is like trying to ring bar from a rock. Um, but it doesn't mean that we, we can't start putting it out there because I mean, I know it, Matt knows it. If there's not a history of the request, then, you know, it's it's not going to happen regardless. So it's like you got to keep Wall, eventually that potential for it right, right. And, and so what is the reality of where our operating budgets are is you almost to propose an increase, you've got to find a way of decreasing something else. Yeah, you got to cut something else. So what do you need from uh, from us with that action? Are you looking for honest? I guess this is a draft, so it's comment. Um, potential revisions, what you like, what you don't like. Um, if you would like to see other things included or explored, I mean, I know there's added detail that could be added in, in in certain areas, but I guess with the policy, it's kind of a fine line as to how far off into the weeds you want to go. And I know Mike Davis likes to say too, that with any policy, there's always going to be something that doesn't get covered. And chances are the very first thing that <laughs> tries to get covered by the policy. Oh yeah. Um, so, you know, what do, what do you guys think? Because obviously I'm coming at it from my lens. And uh, if you guys think that there's other things that need to be included or added, and it doesn't have to happen right now either. You can, you can email it to me, call me, talk to me. I'm fine with that, obviously. I'm more than willing to do that. It sounds like one of the edits might be to allow PRFC to make a recommendation to finance in regards to who the responsible party for paying is. I'll be I'll be glad to. Yeah. I sent you some. Yeah. And I'll send you some more. I try I, I try to do non non-content <laughs> edits. And, yeah. But I'll do okay. some content edits as well. Because I mean I know um like even at the beginning where I say mitigation um possibilities would be explored. I didn't really define what that might be. If we want to have that spelled out, what those mitigation avenues would be, you know, I could put that in. There. I, I think but, that would be excellent. You know, but I was going to also say that is sometimes isn't that very dependent on the tree itself or the situation? Or, so, it situation. Is, it's, it's very situational. So if yeah. you put it in, if you put it in there, you know, you're you got to think about the situation that would be right. So, I mean, I mean, there's a there's the general category of mitigation mm -hmm. you know it's like you know we could we could just prune the the, the fending winds we could prune them but then obviously it is all very situational
but I think aside from you know what I actually have control over, which is the tree, if there's anything else, I would really love to have, and maybe say we would really like to see this added or included into it. And then, then it's not just coming from me. My, my suggestion is that the committee take the month to send any edits to Mark and that we revisit this in August. Would, would anybody object to toning down a little bit about the, the property value and the energy savings just because I think those are really hard to define. Mr. Hubbard said that they're very well laid out and I don't know much about the software, mm -hmm. but I find it hard to believe that it could give a good estimate on the value to the property by a tree. Would you like to, and this is something I actually asked Matt about, if I could provide a list of citations if that would help you as to where it's coming from and the, the methods used for coming up with that. Because uh, in terms of property value, there's a lot of research done. Oh, give that to me and I'll, I'll read it over and then I, sure. I change my tool. I mean, I understand and that's why I did kind of go a little bit more in terms of the definitions for each of those ecosystem benefits, because I know some of them or for the, for the most people um, aren't familiar with well, those. I think it's certainly important to, to point out that there are all these benefits um, because trees are trees are very good things. And some people don't understand it's not just having a nice tree in the street, but it does a lot more for you. Yeah. Because I know, you know, we we don't really hear oftentimes what other committees are talking about, but I know like uh, Mr. Martin Utility Board, they've actually been trying to promote planting of more trees in the cattle ponds, like they're on Esser and whatnot, to help with the gravel transpiration rates. Mm -hmm. And um, my position on that has been like, okay, that's cool. You're you're adding trees to the sink. What's wrong with adding trees to the whole area before everything falls down to that one spot? And you know, and that's kind of the stormwater aspect. The first tenth of any rainfall event doesn't touch the ground underneath the tree. That's why you know, oftentimes it starts to rain, you go underneath the tree for a little while because that'll stay dry. And you know, that's just a real easy way to, to see that. But it comes to that until the lightning pulls. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know the city has looked at this at all, but you know, back in my days with the town, we had these things called swales, part of <clears throat> ditches um, that, that caught a lot of rainwater and hey, gee, you know, they're permeable. Um, we don't have that. And I, I'm not going to suggest that we, we do that here at the same time. That, that area be, between the, the curb and the sidewalk, if that were to be dished at least somewhat, yeah. would that have a negative impact on, on the street trees? Or it depends on the proximity to, to a particular tree. And Obviously, species. The closer you get, you know, the more problematic it would be. Um, I know the city of Madison, um, it's actually my wife, works for the engineering department. She's a landscape architect for them. And they do wherever they can. They'll put those rain garden dishes yeah. in the terrace area. Yeah, um, it's great when you've got those really nice white terrace areas. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, you know we don't really have a lot of those. It's and kind of re hard to retrofit these things. But not only that, developers hate the, the thought of trying to give the city any more right of way land. Well, so. <laughs> yeah, I understood. But but if you could, I mean, I have. Uh, old enough home where the, see the the uh, sidewalk is now below the, the grade of the grass on either side and it's grown yeah. up and and um i was just thinking that it would have been nice to have a little bit more to um so that the ice doesn't build up mm -hmm. because it doesn't have any place to go i think some of that then is you're kind of getting more into the realm of what sustainability committee yeah can kind of no yeah you're right you're right and it's your water so. and sustainability and Matt, are you looking for a motion on this to bring it back next month? Well, uh, you could make that motion. I just, we're ready to move on. Are we ready to move on to the next agenda item? I'm done, man. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
we don't need a motion we'll move on to the last agenda item and just lastly so like i said uh questions at all call email stop by i'm i'm fine with all of it i'll i'll talk with you until i go worse that's what i'm that's what you pay me for so thank you all right thank you very much Rob. all right concept review for bell farm farm street do you want me to share a screen? If, if you're willing to do so, I, I will. Share I'll stop sharing and allow you to. Um, and Kathleen, I'll let you introduce yourself and yeah. Melissa. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Kathleen Slattery Moscow. I'm the developer for Bell Farm. Um, Melissa Huggins is my development consultant. She's here tonight. Uh, Bruce Holler, our civil engineer, would like to be here, but he's sitting in another meeting right now on another project. So we're going to do our best to answer. I'll share a few things about the project, um, as specifically as it relates to Parks and Rec and, and uh, open space. And then, uh, you know, I'll happy to discuss the things that are on your plate related to it so okay um, okay so the property is at the far end of parmenter and uh comes right up to greater graver pond um i think you guys most of you are familiar with that um let's skip through some of this this is the view from the belt line so it's 44 acres um, being developed into uh, residential housing, we're calling it an eco-agro eco wellness hood. Um, one thing that I wanted to point out, like I fell in love with this property. I had, you know, uh, I just, it's stunning. And one of the things that I wanted to point out is that, you know, from the get-go, we designed, um, we designed the, the development from the outside in. So we put, the whole thing was designed with time outside and convening, convening with nature and an active life and respect for earth as the front and center. So we started, uh, we did that by starting with a commitment to 50% open space. And I think the requirement maybe for the 10 is 25%, but this is beautiful land. I wanted to keep as much of it um, uh, open as possible. And I really wanted to foster a place where people could be very active outside, where they um, could get involved with nature, where they could not only be active, but also have a peaceful place for respite. Um, so then we that's where we started and we kind of worked backwards from there. So we wove together a beautiful assembly of outdoor opportunities um, and park space. And we um, just uh, and we intentionally threaded these throughout the property so that people could go on a journey um, as they're moving about the land and experience different things in different areas. So we were very intentional about how the way that this was all um, laid out. Um, so it includes some of the outdoor aspects include butterfly gardens, Santa Monica stairs. I'll show some pictures of that, the, an urban park. Of, um, a meditation area around the pond, the, a farm, an outdoor amphitheater, community gardens, a wellness walkway, woodlands, a dog park, fire pits, tennis court, basketball court, pickleball courts, and a soccer field. And our goal was to work with the land and with the topography and with, uh, you know, uh, the idea of reverence for the land as it relates to rain and bees and trees and everything the earth. So we started with all of that, and I get, as I was working with Phil Tab, who was our land use planner, I mean, I gave him this wish list first. I'm like, this, these are the things that are so important to me to be here. And so start with that, and then around that, then we begin to lay the buildings on the land. So this is where we landed with the property. So on that, um, let's see, I can... Um, so, uh, oh, is that my cursor? Oh, mm -hmm. great. Yes. Okay, awesome. So this over here, this, this side of the property is Misty Valley Road. Over on this side, this is uh, the Beltline Highway, and this is Parmenter Street here. So as you come in from Misty Valley, um, you would, which is a neighborhood over here, it goes on a transect from lower density housing and starts to build heat toward higher density as you get closer to Parmenter. And we built the whole thing around this idea of this urban park, and that's Bellefontaine then moves around the park. The parkway then 
has a walkway that heads down toward Graber Pond. Um, there are paths that cross all of this. Here's the outdoor amphitheater here. We have um, a dog park up here. As you wind your way through the property, through all these like housing units and stuff, there's little paths and walkways that connect one area to the next. In fact, here next to the inn, there is what's called the Santa Monica Stairway. I don't know if anybody's ever done the Santa Monica Stairs in, in Santa Monica, but they're world famous and they're awesome. It works with the topography and gets people outside like climbing. Um, and then up through this end of the property is where we did our the pickleball courts and the tennis courts and basketball courts surround um, some of the multifamily. And then we get into larger courts here and a soccer field and then an urban farm on this end, which includes um, vertical greenhouses for vertical farming. Um, and then as we come down um, again, through the property, more fire pit areas, um, lots of hiking and, and uh, biking trails all throughout the property, tying into the other networks. And again, just so many different opportunities down here. Is the there will be like the, a meditation area here, so that's right near the pond. There will be a, an outlook area here because this is high ground where you can overlook the entire property. And so um, I just wanted to share this because I wanted you to know that we designed this with all of this in mind. Like this is everything you guys do in this department is near and dear to my heart. And um, uh, we wanted to give the entire community, not just the people who live here, but the people throughout Middleton an opportunity to interact with this development and have it be a forest place for people to be able to flow in and out of. We created, we are working on, um, we have angled parking here all along Bellefontaine, which we will be changing most likely based on public works to parallel parking, but we wanted to give lots of access, you know, for people who are not in the development to come in and use, and use the space um, and have greater access to the pond and, and, and yeah, the, the point is to um, connect, um, connect people with each other, connect with nature, connect to the rest of the city. So anyway, I'll leave it, I'll leave it at that for right now. Let's Kathleen, see. can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, and I apologize for not asking this earlier. Yeah. The, the amenities, the basketball courts, the pickleball, tennis courts, the soccer field, are, are those intended to be public yep. or private? Public. Okay. I don't want the, I don't, you know, as much as I think the entire community will use those things, I also don't want things like that sitting there vacant. I want it to be like open and used in a place where I think people are thriving. I'm going to show you, this is the different spaces and the acreage that we have um, laid out for each of those areas. There's two areas that are to be determined because they were still working through the stormwater management plan and we we just don't know how big of a conflict there might be with these two areas, but what we have, um, what we have earmarked so far total seven acres. I'm going to show you a couple of pictures here, um, just to give you. Um, so this is a this is the actual Santa Monica stairs. Again, people from all over LA come to this area, and all over the world actually come to this area, and they do the Santa Monica stairs. It's part of their workout. They're outside. It's exciting. We wanted something that would really work with the topography because one of the whole points is we were like developing the entire site was to work with the land and not against the land. Um, lots of wildflower areas in that urban park area. This is actually a picture of Graber Pond that I took in November of 2019. Um, but to give an idea of, uh, again, these walkways that are going to, these paths that are going to snake through and cut. To, so there will be this unfolding sense of wonder. It's not like all the park amenities will all be in one spot. There will be a sense of wonder as you navigate the, the territory and that's gonna encourage people to walk more, bike more, run more. Um, this is just a little peek at like, again, another pass, but there's gonna be a lot of peekaboo areas through the building so that you're gonna be able to see into different areas of nature, fire pit areas. Um, these are pictures of, of an idea of what the vertical farming looks like. There's going to be community gardening. Um, the, the farm part is uh, 
uh, you know, it, it's there for a lot of different reasons, but, you know, uh, sustainability around food, uh, resourcefulness around food. Can I ask that the, the, the farm part that you're talking mm -hmm. about, is that also public space? or is that Yeah, so private? like we're figuring out how that will be open to the public. I'm looking at different models around the country right now where the farm has, has certain times that it's open to the public and then maybe the gate is closed during certain times. So we're looking at what that model would be like. Mm -hmm. um, but that's the intention. Um, I mean, who would be farming there? We're we're working through the business model right now in terms of, again, there are different models throughout the country where people, where different developments have included the farm and it can look a lot of different ways. And we're sorting through that right now. I'm actually flying, um, I'm flying to Atlanta in a couple of weeks to meet with the farm manager down by Atlanta um, to look at the different ways that this could play out. And then this final picture, again, just like Graber Pond is beautiful and trying to allow and encourage more access while also respecting the land and the wetlands around it. Um, so anyway, that is the project. Um, it's a big project and I know there are probably a lot of questions and things that are important to you guys to discuss. Is it a, a timeline or an anticipated timeline? Well, our goal through the end of this year is to get through our GIP zoning, is to get through GIP. Because again, we're dealing with um, multifamily along Parmenter, single, there, we're doing a lot of different housing types. So on the back 30 acres, it's single family and townhomes and shotgun homes and nest homes and cottages. And then along Parmenter, it will be multifamily, but we're looking to do multifamily that is integrated with the whole community where it's not just like over here on the side and its own thing. We want there to be a lot of porous, community interactions between the multifamily and the single family and everybody using all these amenities. So anyway, <laughs> looking to get through um, through uh, the, the rezoning pro process by the end of the year, then we will be starting on some of the aspects related to the single family while we're then designing the multifamily. That is the actual, we're working with multifamily architects right now, of course, on the footprint and the loads and, and the yield studies and all of that. But in terms of the actual design of the buildings, those won't start until we're done with zoning. And that process alone will take a good year before we even, you know, start to break ground or anything along right. those lines. Uh, it says anything in parts are you looking at owner occupied um, family or so all there the, the there are 140 um single family houses ownership mm -hmm. and then there's they're slated to be 600 multifamily however we're looking to do 40 of those as possible condos and that could shift this is going to be done in phases even the along parmenter sure, sure. so we're going to do it in phases to also like be open to how the market and everything might shift throughout yeah, time. Yeah, 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 things are kind of at this point, I understand that. Right, yeah, so we want to have a really beautiful blend of ownership and rental, but the thing we're going to, we're hoping to do different with the rental is that I want to create rental units that people never want to leave, that they covet so much that it's not so that there's not this constant churn and that you're not just building short-term buildings up, um, you know, our, we're building for durability, both in terms of aesthetic, but also just in, I want to build something that goes on the historic register at some point. Um, on the park, mm -hmm. but, um, you mentioned the parking that's going to be parallel parking. Yeah. Is that parking primarily for the park or for the residents or for both? It's a combination, it's, but it's it's mostly, the, the parking that is going to go along Bellefontaine is mostly going to be for people coming into the community and visiting. Because those single family houses will have their own parking spots, like garages right. and stuff. Yep. It's one because and those... not that not that people visiting those spaces. And Melissa, I don't know if you want to jump in here at all. If there's anything you wanted to say about that. Yeah. So the parking. I mean, obviously, uh, streets are for parking, right? Um, and I know that that's still a new concept for for um, Madison and Middleton, but. Um, Truly, the best use of our asphalt is to have it have multiple uses, 
And so the value of those um, parking spaces along the, the, the park is number one, it slows traffic down. And number two, it gives, um, you know, people can come in and park and, 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 and you know, use the trails um, and enjoy and enjoy Graber Pond. So that has always been a goal of Kathleen's is to make sure that there is parking for others who would like to come and enjoy the, the, the natural open space. I was wondering if the parking would be allowed the inside of Bellefontaine rather than the outside and how public works might look at that. I mean, obviously you're not accustomed to that because you don't have as good a view to your right as you do your left as you're playing out of a parking spot. But it's just a thought that occurred to me because if you want to give access to the park, obviously if you're- The parking park, is on the, um, it's along the park. It's on the inside? It's on the inside. Okay, maybe I didn't have a very good- Yeah, view. it's hard to see. Uh, here, here, if you wanna- uh, what, you what, can... what, What's the um, the road width? We're, we're still working through, I oh, don't know what they yeah, have it yeah. written here, but we're still working through a lot of different things with uh, public works because Bellefontaine was originally gonna be one thing and then I'd, things I'd have encourage, shifted. I'd encourage all the commission members to look at the next public works committee meeting and read the staff report on that issue. Thank you. Because I, I think there's a lot of discussion to be had on what Bellefontaine, not just for this project, but right. the map Bellefontaine, what is the city's intention and plan moving forward? So it's a little strange right now. That's what I was kind of thinking because Bellefontaine. Yes, it is not. My, my idea was was to be more of a thoroughfare. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and Bell Fontaine something that was before the Bell Farm or, or yeah, the yes. same thing. It's, yeah. Well, so, so Bell Fontaine is an existing boulevard in the Misty Valley subdivision okay. that was intended to be a four-lane um, thoroughfare. Okay. And the developer at the time was only required to build half of the four lanes with um, some condition to build the whole thing in the future. So it looks rather high because you've got this large space adjacent to the road. So um, I'll just share my thoughts and, and it's changed during this meeting is that um, we are, are in vision in this area. I think everyone's aware that we don't have a community park north of Century Avenue between Parmenter and um, the Pheasant Branch Conservancy. It's a really underserved from a community park standpoint. I really like this concept because it, it spreads out the amenities and it divides and buffers them in a way I've not really seen before. Mm -hmm. And I think that gives a lot of benefit in separating uses and dispersing parking. And I think there's a lot of hope here that people are going to walk and bike to these amenities instead of park to them. And we can all hope for that. Sure. This particular screen that's up, it uh, has the numbers on it and it shows the, where the different park spaces are. So um, there's a little legend on the upper right, but the, obviously the urban park is number one. Number two in that uh, left area is the dog park. Um, three are the sport courts and soccer field area, four is the, is the farm, five is the meditation overlook for the pond, six is the entire bell farm overlook that's higher ground, um, seven and eight are the ones that um, I just, I did not put any acreage down yet because again, we're currently working with civil on the, on stormwater management and um, and I just, I, I don't know where that's going to land, so I didn't want to promise anything, but that's, uh, the intention is that, you know, uh, the intention is we'd love to be able to use that as park space. And I think actually Melissa has a question about that as well uh, from Bruce. Um, um, I just, you're going to word it better than I do. Melissa. No, so, so the question was, is, you know, what is Middleton's um, policy on um, stormwater management, the sort of the cross-pollination of parks and stormwater management. You know, can, can they get count towards both or do you have to separate them now or how do, how do we weave them together in a way that benefits everyone? So um, 
the edict has been no stormwater in city parks. Um, and it really stems over who's responsible for the maintenance of that stormwater feature. Um, not saying that's the only way, but that's how things have been handled up until this point and, and what's been conveyed to other concurrent development prospects in the city. So is it that, that parks does not want to be responsible for that stormwater management? Okay. Correct. Yeah, yeah. okay. Or so the city doesn't want to be responsible for the stormwater management. And maintenance thereof. And maintenance thereof. Okay. So am I, am I hearing a little flexibility if we came up with a, a solution to that? I mean, another question that we had is, um, how is it when, when parkland is dedicated, do you always take over maintenance or are there situations where it's technically public land, but the, the, the developer still maintains it? That would be a new proposal. That's not something that's been done. I'm not, I tend to be maybe more flexible than, then I, I think this is a unique and new way of looking at parkland and, and that you've created a seven acre community park mm -hmm. in a very untraditional way. And I think there's, there's merit in, in that development. Along with that, I'm not saying that there aren't other models that this could be managed and, and it's, you're fighting years of tradition versus a different way of looking at things. And I'm always open, and this is just me speaking, I'm always open to new ways of doing things. And we have, so the last park development that we did, just as an example, we collected about $600,000 in park fees and the park cost a million and a half dollars to develop. So we've got an issue ongoing with our park fees and the ability to to develop the parks in a way that our community wants them to see. And I, I think this aligns, the, my perspective, that this type of development aligns with a lot of Middleton and, and what people want to see. Um, and, and that we're going to have high expectations of what these parks look like. And our, our park fees aren't going to cover the cost of their development. And so therefore, we have to find additional dollars and the change to the park fee law isn't going to let us find other other dollars from other developments so this is solely going to be developed by park fees collected or capital dollars which we have so much deferred maintenance and and, and issues in our existing park system that the likelihood of capital dollars going to a new park uh, I don't see that in the horizon there's always the developer that might want to help with some of the development costs. Well, there's there's also this ongoing discussion about increasing our park fees. And do. Melissa, did you have any questions about any of that that was just said? No, that makes uh, good sense to me. I mean, I think it's uh, we probably want to uh, sort of an off offline meeting maybe to discuss what the strategy might be. Um, and, and look at some of those other models. I don't know, Matt, whether you've done that that kind of research or it would be helpful if we brought some things and said, here's where it's worked in other places. Yeah, I, I'm open to that. I I know locally Wanakee does things a little bit different than the rest of our peer communities and how I think everyone else is pretty aligned in how they develop their parks. Wanakee is, is there's more of a developer presence in the, in how Wanakee develops its parks. So I, I just want to clarify here that when you look at this, you see this as, you know, you it, it, the way you normally do business, you would be responsible for building out these trails and everything else. You would do the Santa Monica stairs, a la, a la Wisconsin. Um, and that so would let's be... back up a minute. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Someone's going to have to explain the ADA Title II law that allows you to build something like that to me, because that was my first yeah. reaction of that's really yeah. cool, but I don't know how you accomplish it understanding ADA Title II. Well, yes. 
through through that through that. Okay, right. I, I guess another question is: Does every every aspect of a uh, trail need to be ADA accessible? And I know some people that um, say that it doesn't. If you'd really like a laugh, ADA Title II includes no definition of what an accessible trail is. I, I know. Okay, and 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 there's a lot of holes in it, and some people in the the DNR that I've spoken to about these things. And yeah, yeah, that's kind of a, it is what it is. If you're able to deal with it, you're great. If you can't, you can't. Everything's good until the Department of Justice shows up. To that's that. right. It, when, the, when the lawyer speaks, that's when you have to listen, right? Um, I guess the other thing that I, you know, point, adding to what Matt was saying, but when, when you turn this over to parks, Parks is going to look at it and determine whether we want to have Santa Monica stairs there or not. Um, if you want them there, well, maybe you ought to be providing them in advance. And so, well, I, I will say though, Santa Monica stairs weren't in the acreages I put down. So we could well, build, you but, know. You know, but let's back up to, to David's point. One of and I was it, it, there was a laundry list of all the ex outside amenities, you know, but I wasn't necessarily thinking that the Santa Monica stairs will fall under Parks Department. Yeah, but I just have to back up and say that I need to make sure that I'm treating all development in in somewhat a similar discussion. Right, right. And that discussion with other developers has been that the city designs its parks. Right. And and we've ran into issue where developers are putting things out and calling things names and designing Got a park. Got it. And, and then we kind of have to say, no, we're going to, and again, I think you're talking, that was in complete, here's the land, the city is responsible for developing it, maintaining it, all of that. And we're trying to tell you what we want. I think what you're suggesting is there may be some other models to look at that I think it's advantageous yeah. to at least explore, have those discussions as Melissa suggested, I think offline is, mm -hmm. is the best place for those discussions. Um, but, and just as an aside, because I, I don't want to spend too much time right. on this, but from a PRFC standpoint, we need to get ahead of development, not here, but adjacent. This is the corridor that Middleton's going to develop over the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. And we need to identify mm -hmm. where we want to look at parkland, what type of parks we want, and determine is it advantageous for the city to try and go out and negotiate with those landowners in, in terms of acquiring that land, rather than always reacting to, and I'm not talking about this development, no, but you're right. we've got very scarce land left and, and it, it, the pressure is going to be immense on it very soon. And we need to be, and I've had this discussion with Abby about doing a, like a corridor study or, or a neighborhood or a regional study and trying to identify some of those and, things. And here we have a developer that obviously is quite interested yeah. in doing great things with parks. Wonderful, but not every developer is. And, sure. and mm -hmm. after it's been acquired and plans are put in place, that's- It's totally really hard at that point. Yeah. Matt, can I ask when you, um, are you thinking of a property touching ours? that you're looking at? I mean, because I'm thinking, you know, Misty Valley is off yeah, to it, the- It's going to be very not touching, but I, I think the, the challenge is, is in this area, there's probably what, 200, close to 200 acres that are going to develop and likely in some form of residential development. And we need to be ahead of mm -hmm. it. The, the one interesting thought that was thrown out about this is getting a underpass under Bellefontaine as part of the trail network to connect to Graver. Mm. We, we've had a lot of success with um, avoiding at grade crossings with our trail system. Mm -hmm. And if there's an opportunity to, to look at that here and, and how, how you, you know, eliminate or, or avoid as many car, bike, pedestrian um, mm -hmm. potentials that that, you know, we, we have, um, at Par obviously Parmenter and the Creek Corridor, um, out uh, Airport Road area, we, you know, Market Street, we've got a number of those underpasses that um, really make our trail system safe and unique mm -hmm. from a lot of communities our size. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Any other questions or comments? Or 
anything before we unrelated departments has have any discussions been had with the fire department? I believe Bruce might have started some of those conversations. Because there was some issues at Middleton Hills regarding street widths and you've got runway and parking and and um Chief Harris has been a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. Melissa, you're are you noting that? Yep. Um I yes, know. I am. I know that the multifamily, so we had a, a land use planner, obviously, who laid everything out, but the multifamily architects too, as they were, they were, I mean, fire was like top of mind as they were looking at Middleton and, and then this property and giving access and um, it's why some of the roads are laid out the way that they are, but we'll make sure that Bruce has also done his outreach. It's just that when you have those larger buildings, they are yeah. gonna to wanna to get a ladder truck. Exactly. Which is the worst thing to try to get through. Right, right. It was the reason some of those roads are not, are the size they are, the placement they are, were to be able to get that access. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, sorry, fans. Are the bucks winning? I don't know. I think it was over an hour. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, other no comments. Thank you very much for you. attending our meeting tonight. Um, I'll accept the motion to adjourn. Motion made to adjourn. Do a second. Second. All those in favor? All right. We're adjourned. Night, all. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Melissa. <laughs> yep. Thank you. 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 Thank you.